This is a podcast that I've been very excited about making, and this is a guest that I've been very eager to have on my podcast and on my YouTube channel, uh, Reverend Danny Nemu. Reverend Danny Nemu is a, uh, a pioneer in the psychedelic world, and he is a great bridge for gapping uh, shamanic knowledge or connecting shamanic knowledge to Christianity. And um, we had a great little talk here. And, of course, not unlike every other podcast I've done, we have all kinds of uh, video issues and audio issues. Um, we did this on Skype, so there was uh, yeah, there, it was a little hard to do, but I think, I think we did okay for what we were working with. And um, I'm a big fan of uh, Danny. And I uh, hope to have him back on again. And uh, I hope you guys welcome him, welcome him in warmly. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Enjoy the Place podcast. for Humans podcast. Uh, today I got a guest that I've been excited uh, about having. Uh, we've tried collaborating before, and we've been talking about collaborating for, I don't know, it feels like a year or something. It's been a while. So I'm excited about this one. This is, uh, do I call you Reverend? Reverend Danny Nemu, do I call you? Oh. Oh. Yep, we're back now, I think. I lost you two for a sec. Um, okay, we actually wasn't recording any of that, so I fucked up. Okay. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of A Place for Humans podcast. My name is Dakota, and I've got a guest today that I've been wanting to have on the podcast and wanting to have on my YouTube channel for a long time. His name is Reverend Danny Nemu, and uh, apparently he's a real reverend, so he claims. Uh, tell us a story about, well, tell, tell us your story. Give us a little introduction. Um, how'd you get into the things you're into? What are you into for uh, people that don't know? Oh, man. I'm into most give me the, things. Give me the rundown. Um, I'm into most things except cars and football. Um... I'm a reverend, and uh, I take that very seriously. It took me, uh, it cost me fifteen dollars. Uh, when I lived in Japan, I used to, I had five jobs. Um, I worked in a bong shop with one of them, but on weekends I used to perform weddings dressed in my uh, reverend's robes. And in order to do that, I needed to get ordained. So I got ordained for fifteen dollars on the internet. And um, yeah, I used to marry five people a day sometimes, and. Uh, I used to be able to sing What a Friend You Have in Jesus in Japanese because, um, yeah, it's a kind of crazy industry there. So I'm a reverend in the sense that I am ordained. Um, I'm a kind of scripture freak. Um, yeah, what else am I into? I'm into all sorts, really. I mean, my, I don't know if you see my books over there. Um, I quite like psychedelics. Yeah, see <laughs> yeah, that's how I found you. So I found you when I was actually, I remember the moment I was listening to you a podcast with you in it. I was in Jordan, the country of Jordan. I was just traveling along by myself. I rented a car, driving all around the country. I uh, had just left the Dead Sea, so I'm driving along this road with the Dead Sea next to me on my way to the Moses Memorial. And uh, I don't know, I, I'm into the mystical side of, uh, in, uh, of spirituality, like psychedelics and stuff like that. And I knew Moses was a mystic, or at least appeared to be a mystic from the things that I could gather, you know, with like the burning bush and stuff. So I was going to visit and pay my respects to the Moses Memorial. And that's how I found out about you. So I was just Googling like psychedelics in the Bible and stuff like that. And you popped up and uh, yeah, here we are. I mean, Moses. What, what, what got, I mean, yeah, yeah, tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, let's, let's talk about Moses, man. Uh, Moses is, uh, is interesting, dude. I just published this article, um, when was it? About a couple of months ago in the Journal of Psychedelic Studies. And it's the first, probably the last peer reviewed. Um, kind of academic journal I published, but it starts off looking at um, Moses as a shaman, and I'm kind of drawing on this paper by uh, by uh, Winkleman, um, Michael Winkleman. His name is. He wrote a book called Shamanism, but uh, in 2013 he he surveyed these uh, 47 different traditional societies, looking at magico religious practitioners, basically shamans, and he finds. Um, a, a kind of a, a group of motifs that you see in all of these different cultures 
And um, I'll just, I've just got them here, actually. I'll just read them out to you. Um, a dominant social role as the preeminent charismatic leader, a nighttime community ritual, use of chanting, singing, drumming and dancing, initiatory crisis involving death and rebirth, shamanic training involving the induction of an altered state of consciousness, particularly with, particularly with fasting and social isolation, altered state of consciousness characterises the soul journey, uh, visionary experiences, divination, diagnosis, prophecy, healing, illness believed to be caused, caused by spirits and sorcerers, and animal relations as a source of power, including controlling animals and transforming into animals, malevolent acts of sorcery, including the ability to kill, and hunting magic, and uh, uh, assistance in acquiring for food. So I was looking at these tropes in the Bible, and pretty much every, in fact, all of them except for one, is in the stories of Moses or his sister, the prophetess Miriam, or his brother. Um, I guess one that is uh, there obliquely is he doesn't actually turn into an animal, but there's times when his stick his rod turns into an animal. But you've got, I mean, all the others, you've got, uh, you know, the killing of the firstborn, for example, the hunting magic. Um, there's the uh, ability to find, uh, well, he finds water, for example, um, in his divination. He also finds food, uh, healing, uh, divination, altered states of consciousness. All of these tropes are found in the stories of Moses. Use of chanting, singing and drumming. And, you know, he, int he introduces three nighttime rituals as well. So I thought that was pretty nuts that <clears throat> he so clearly fitted the bill of a shaman <clears throat> yes i mean outside of uh the story of moses do you, do we get any of these other kind of people like this in this area like is there a culture of shamanism in this area yeah prior to moses yeah it's an interesting question like the so the other so the one the one trope the one shamanic trope which isn't um which he doesn't hit actually is uh this thing uh the experience of a soul journey so the kind of traditional sh shamanic soul journey when you you know you play your drum or do whatever you do and then go off on a on a journey. So Moses doesn't actually do that. Moses it says in the Bible he talks uh, to Yahweh face to face as a man talks to his friend. But the other ones, the other ones do that. Like uh, Enoch, for example, there's this line about Enoch, and it says, um, and Enoch, how's it go? Uh, and Enoch walked with Elohim, uh, and he was not for Elohim took him. Um, so you've got this kind of idea of him disappearing from where he is and not being there anymore, be, be, being taken on a journey. So they did have these um, these other tropes in, in other biblical figures. Uh, but Moses is kind of like a super prophet or a super shaman. So he doesn't need to do the, the, uh, spirit, the soul journey. He just gets to talk to his friend. Right. Um, so what kind of what kind of culture is there prior to Moses uh, as far as shamanic cultures go? Oh, right. Or, uh, you know, prior to Christianity or... <clears throat> in that area, um, I mean, that's an interesting question. We don't have, like, in terms of those kind of tropes, what have we got? We've got, you've got archaeological evidence from, um, like, from at least the 14th century BC. And the stories of Moses were written down in probably 10th century BC. Um, whether he was actually around or not is a kind of a, a question that's up for debate. But his stories are first written in the... 14th century, uh, sorry, in the 10th century BC. Um, the, the finding of cannabis in uh, quite near Jerusalem in forms which are uh, both smokable and uh, uh, kind of suggesting transdermal application, like basically rubbing on your skin, which is what happens in the Bible with um, the anointing oil. And uh, um, so there's archaeological evidence for that. Um, but further further back than that, I mean, you've got the Canaanite religion. They worshipped Baal, um, but I'm not entirely sure. I mean, no, they they did it with frankincense, so they were they were using um, psychoactive right. uh, psychoactive stuff. But um, the details of those of those religions, I don't think we know all that much about. Actually, no, we do know something because there was the there was a snake worshipping cult um, uh, in the I think in the northern the northern part of uh, the uh, of the Holy Land. Because there's bits about the, I guess kind of complex, but there's two there's two two documents that go into the Bible, and one of them, uh, they seem to have a snake worshiping uh, cult going on. So that seems pretty. Yeah, shiny. what's what's up with the snake and this reoccurring symbol of the snake? Do you know anything about this? It seems to be such a reoccurring theme in all traditions, regardless of being shamanic traditions or not. Specifically in shamanic traditions, it seems. But I mean, in the Bible, you got this uh, symbol of the serpent, and you know something I just found out that was really interesting is that Zeus was actually a serpent before. Uh, becoming Zeus. Did you know that, that no, he was originally? No, no. <clears throat> yeah, I read that. I read that in uh, a book called *The Cosmic Serpent*, 
if you've read that book or not. Uh, it's a really good book by Jeremy Narby. Yeah, I know the book. Uh, I don't remember that bit. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, if you look at the at the Hindu tradition, um, there's a there's a, 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 a kind of pre god called uh, Ananta, um, and yeah. he's a, a a snake with one body and a thousand heads, and he out out of out of this. Uh, out of this ananta, which actually means zero in the uh, in, in terms of like Hindu mathematics, it means the word means zero. Um, he's he kind of sits there in the in the primal sea, so yeah, it all kind of traces back to snakes. I think um, something interesting about snakes is that you know uh, they're they're built. The fear of snakes is built into us on a on a on a on a very very deep level. Um, if you show a, yeah. if you if you keep a certain birds i think it's ostriches but basically if you keep birds in isolation and never show them a snake and then show them a show them a something which looks like a snake they instinctively attack it so um i think right. part of it is we've got a very instinctive instinctive relationship uh with snakes but also you know it's um in terms of its symbolism it's fantastic because it's i mean it's, it's obviously it's quite phallic looking um it's also kind of slithery and quite um it's got that kind of wave thing going on which is perhaps more feminine and it's also it's got the power to kill and it also sheds its skin which is quite a nice image of uh of the trans of of, of transformation yeah it is but it's just so interesting to me that it's found in such foreign cultures cultures that i mean would otherwise be kind of alien to each other are still have this symbol of the serpent it seems like i mean i guess from an evolutionary perspective it kind of makes sense that <clears throat> That this that we would kind of uh, have some powerful serpent figure, but it seems almost too coincidental how how often it's found. Mm. What maybe you can explain what the serpent means in like the story of Genesis or something like that? What's some of the symbology? Yeah, that? yeah, I'd like to do that, actually. He's um, so what we know about the snake is uh, this line from um, I think it's the last line of Genesis two. Um, um, no, it's the first line of uh, Genesis three. And it says, um, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. So a super interesting line for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it doesn't um, necessarily mean that Yahweh Elohim made, made the snake. Like it's ambiguous both in the Hebrew and the English as to whether the snake was there before Yahweh Elohim, who's the kind of first God name that puts his foot on the planet, uh, who appears. So there's a kind of an implication or there's a, there's a way of reading that line that says that the snake was already there before everything else arrived, including Yahweh Elohim, which is quite interesting. Cause like I say, in the, in the Hindu before creation of the, before the creation of the world, before Brahma, before anything, you already have this snake. Uh, and same with the Aztec traditions. <clears throat> you have uh, Quetzalcoatl. He's there before creation. Is he? Sort of, uh, he's it's, it's where it's this, it's the stem of creation. Yeah. That's super interesting because this thing about the um, in the Hindu tradition again, Ananta's got one body but a thousand heads. So you can see this idea of sort of right. coming from a point into into all. And actually, it kind of relates. I think it relates to the Hebrew letter Aleph, which means both one and a thousand as well. But back to that line, right? The serpent was more subtle. If you go to the the, the previous verse, which is Genesis, the last verse of Genesis two. It says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And then the, the next line is, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. Now that word um, naked, uh, which describes the innocence of Adam and Eve in Genesis 2.25, is arom in Hebrew, arom, right? And then the word for subtle, which describes what we tend to think of as the kind of evilness of the snake, or certainly the sneakiness, sneakiness of the snake, is uh, arom in Hebrew. And if you look on a scroll, actually, one is written like immediately above. So the, the words are right next to each other, basically. And they're spelt in Hebrew in exactly the same way. You can't, you, can't, you can't tell between them. And the pronunciation of the Bible, right, uh, of the Old Testament, um, it was fixed in the 7th century AD. So you already had, like, I mean, that story would have been like well over a 1,000 years old by the time somebody decided how, well, it was the Masorites, decided exactly how it was meant to be pronounced. But before that, you have all these different traditions of pronunciation, you know, so, uh, and, and the way that you pronounce words um, influences or, or it, it, the word changes completely the meaning of it in order, uh, right. according to how you pronounce it. So like in the, there's a line about the, um, uh, or there's a midrash basically from the Talmud. It says that there's, there's 70 faces of the Torah, which means that there's, there's 70 different ways you can read each verse, right? 
So that line is, uh, I find it fascinating. The, the nakedness of Adam and Eve is the same word as the subtleness of uh, the snake. And then you hear it again because um, um, Adam gets asked by Yahweh Elohim, he says, why did you hide? And he says, I hid because I was, and he uses the same word again, he, uh, which is naked, but it also means subtle, as in sneaky, and it also means prudent. And then you get into like Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, that same word appears, um, I think it's 18 times or something like that. And every time it's a virtue, it's never, it's never a vice. Yeah. So we have this idea that the snake is a bad guy, but he's never, he only gets one adjective in the, in the entire Bible. He only gets one word describing him in the entire Bible. And that word is a kind of a word which can mean prudent or naked or subtle. A, a Yahweh, for example, gets described as evil in various verses. So we have this idea that the snake's the good guy and the other guy's the bad guy. Yahweh's the bad guy, but it's not from the text. That's from tradition that comes later. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe you can explain some about Yahweh because Yahweh, they were communicating with Yahweh um, through kind of the same means that shamans kind of invoke different <coughs> spirits, maybe in the Amazon or even like we were talking about before we got on the podcast of these Mazatec Indians, so these Mazatec people in Mexico. They invoke all kinds of spirits using the mushroom or through different types of uh, lighting incense and mantra and chanting and stuff like that. And it seems like the same thing is being expressed in these stories with Yahweh, maybe uh, because they were using certain things to invoke the voice of Yahweh, right? Or Moses was. Yeah, exactly. So Moses was. Um, the other prophets who also speak to Yahweh, um, they don't do that. So you get some of them who will use like Asana, they'll use certain uh, positions some of them will fast some of them will kind of practice sexual abstinence some of them will go to special places um some of them meet yahweh when they're unhappy like there's a bunch of different reasons or, or in dreams or whatever it might be so like this specifically we're talking about the the priestly uh the priestly caste who encounter yahweh with um in the tabernacle and uh, that's this is what the, my uh, kind of recently published article is about is about all the various different drugs that are used in the tabernacle so uh, and Moses himself when he first encounters Yahweh um, I don't think he's taking anything there's no there's no reason to believe that he is taking anything but when um, like for example the priest the priestly line they all are obliged to uh, be anointed with a particular oil um, and if they uh, and, and the line goes like this they should be anointed um, that they can minister unto me, and it's Yahweh speaking. So, without having this oil experience, then they don't. They're not allowed to uh, to minister. They're not allowed to be priests. Um, there's another line where uh, King David, but all the kings were had this anointing experience as well. And there's this line uh, where I wonder if I've got it here. No, I don't think I've got it here. But it says something along this Samuel, and it says. Um, he anointed David, and from that day forward, the spirit of Yahweh was upon David. So the oil is very specifically used to introduce people to Yahweh, specific, like specifically the priest, the priests, and um, and the king. And both of those roles, the priest and the king, are where the tribe is kind of the uh, let's say the hinge point or the opening point between the tribe and and the deity. In this case, Yahweh. Um, so what would happen, so this oil contains four ingredients. It contains uh, cinnamon, cassia, myrrh, and canebosum, which is, uh, I mean, we can go into it later, but that's very likely to be cannabis. So all the priests had this put upon them, and then the, the, the normal priests would go off and they'd eat something called showbread, which is quite interesting in itself. But then the high priest would then go to the back of the tabernacle, having this oil put upon him, and um, maybe I'll just explain the oil a little bit. The, the oil's got a wide range of enzyme inhibitors. In fact, if you if you take uh, like cinnamon and cassia together, they're both different forms of the the the, uh, the cinnamon plant um, or different species. Let's say uh, yeah. cassia inhibits one of the five cytochrome enzymes, which uh, which breaks down drugs, and cinnamon inhibits the other four. Right, so. We're getting quite complicated quite quickly. I hope I'm not going too fast here, but in the same way that um, in the same way that ayahuasca um, has an enzyme inhibitor, which is either harmine or harmaline or beta carbolines, um, which allows the DMT to get to your brain, right? Because it's a mixture of two plants, right? If you just eat DMT on its own, it won't do anything to you because it doesn't get into your brain. But if you inhibit your enzymes, 
then that DMT can uh, it's it uh, it doesn't get broken down; it ends up in your brain. So in the same way, it, the cytochrome system, which breaks down most drugs, gets inhibited by cinnamon and cassia. The oil has also got cannabis and myrrh in it, and myrrh is full of opioid receptor. Works on the same system as opium and heroin and things like that. And um, and then what happens is the high priest himself would go alone into a chamber in the back of the tabernacle. And the chamber is four and a half meter cubed square, right? So it's like a small box and it's very tightly sealed. You know, the way that the, the, way that the tabernacle is described, um, it's described in intricate de- detail in, uh, in the book of Exodus. It gets uh, five chapters, basically. Were they moving so it around? Very, very t- uh, yeah, so that's the story. It's a tent that was moved around. The tent, it has like a kind of acacia frame and then it's got like... Um, four different types of materials. So it's got two which go straight down the side of this acacia frame and then they're pinned into the ground. And then it's got two which kind of act as a, as a windbreak uh, outside it. And the the most outside one is a, is a super thick leather. It was used to make shoes, for example. So what they get in, what, what you have when this is made is a smoke box, like a kind of a hot box, basically. And it's, uh, uh, and the veil at the front of it, I'm talking about the back chamber of the, of the tabernacle here, the veil is described in the time of the temple as the thickness of a man's hand, right? So you've got this super fat veil which completely seals a four and a half meter chamber. And in there, there's only one object, which is the magic box, the Ark of the Covenant, or maybe the Ark of the Alliance would be another word. You know how you hear about shamans making alliances with, uh, with their allies, yeah. with their spirit allies. So, th- so the word covenant also means alliance. And the only other thing that was allowed to be taken into that room was a sensor, like an incense burner, and handfuls of uh, psych- uh, handfuls of resins, finely ground resins. And these resins, you know, they contain. Oh, I'll give you a list here. It's like myrrh, cassia, spikenard, um, which boosts dopamine and boosts GABA and boosts a whole lot of stuff in your in your brain. Saffron, costus, they're both related to ecstasy. Um, what else have you got? You've got onica, you've got galbanum, which works on the GABA system, which is the same system that Valium works on. Frankincense, which is packed full of um, kind of interesting psychoactives. And uh, yeah, basically, so they go back into this, uh, into this, well, the high priest would go alone into this chamber, burn loads and loads of smoke, and then sit there in this box and talk to the angels and have vision. And then he'd come out with the results of his divination, you know? which is very much the shamanic, uh, what shamanism was used for and still is used for actually in, uh, in the jungle. Right. You know, divination, particularly on, on um, areas of health and uh, areas of military kind of strategy. When do we attack uh, the enemy tribe? Because the shaman's job is to protect his tribe, both from disease from the inside and also from like uh, enemy, enemy movements and also to find water and to find game. So you see all of those three tropes in what Moses does. So how many gods are there of the old testament were they only communicating with yahweh or are there multiple is there multiple beings they're communicating with <clears throat> yeah um so this depends on who you ask right so uh most modern day jews and christians would say it's one god yeah um if you go back to the time when it was written or, or rather the verses that are still in the bible now you get lines like um i think it's jethro says now i know that yahweh is mightier than all the gods of egypt right and that's not monotheism, that's uh, paganism, um, or they call it monolatry, which is it's kind of like, um, let's say, a, a monogamous paganism, where you know there are other gods, but you just select one and you right, worship right. that one, right? Having said that, you've then got, I think it's about 60 different names of God. Yeah, like, you know, uh, Yahweh is the Lord, then you've got um, the Lord of Hosts, for example, is so it's, it's the, the kind of um, the weaponized one, like the, the Lord of Armies, basically. And you've got Yahweh Rapha, which is uh, the Lord of Cure. You've got El Shaddai, for example, which is the one that Abraham encounters. And his personality is completely different. So the, the story of Abraham is really indicative in this, in, this, uh, in this aspect, because like El Shaddai, or someone who presents himself as El Shaddai, says to Abraham, go and sacrifice your son, Isaac. And so Abraham prepares the sacrifice, and he's taking Isaac up the hill, and um, then when he draws the knife, an angel of Yahweh comes to, say, comes to him and says, don't sacrifice your son. So you've got two different gods saying different things, and, and Abraham has to choose which one he's going to follow. Yeah? Um, 
so, I mean, this is the, the subject of my second book, which is called Neuro Apocalypse, is looking at these different God names as different, um, different aspects of, uh, of, of psychology or different aspects of neurology, in fact. So what I, what I believe is that El Shaddai is the reptilian brain because reptiles do actually sacrifice their children. They, uh, you know, snakes will eat their, will eat baby snakes if they can catch them, you know. But right. uh, mammals don't do that. So you think Yahweh comes along? You think that's an expression? You think that's an expression of some ancient part of our evolution, or you think this is an archetype? Um, I think that um, I think that people who learn to navigate their own inner space, right, whether that's through the breath or whether that's through psychoactives or something, can access different as different parts of their own. Uh, their own mind. I mean, a, a friend of mine, for example, was studying um, a, quite a martial form of Tai Chi, and uh, he said his teacher used to kind of uh, would demonstrate how to go back into the into the reptilian mm. the reptilian part of the mind, and then he would fight from that particular zone, right? Um, so th that's what I think. Yeah, I think you've got access to these these various different uh, zones, and they have very different flavors. So, for example, Yahweh is the god who's interested in the tribe and loving your brothers and sisters and loving your tribe, but hating your enemy. And that's very much a, um, a an aspect of, um, of well, basically oxytocin. Uh, oxytocin makes you, it's, you know, it's, it's considered the love, um, it's what makes us love, but also makes us um, hate others. There's been some experiments and like really kind of a, quite chilling experiments from, uh, from Holland about uh, if you give someone oxytocin, they're kind of more likely to, um, um, basically they're more likely to discriminate against people who aren't who they don't consider from their tribe like people with uh, islamic names for example so oxytocin kind of brings us together but also pushes enemies pushes enemies away so yahweh his um the uh, the sacrifice that he demands from moses is that you shouldn't boil uh, a baby uh, goat in its mother's milk ba boil a kid in its mother's milk which is why jews don't eat milk and meat together right and that is a representation of the love between a mother and a child which is something that snakes don't have and, you know, uh, reptiles don't have. Um, when El Shaddai is speaking, he's talking about territory and procreation and survival, right? When Yahweh is speaking, he's not talking about those things. He's talking about tribal unity. Uh, he says, I will give you the land. And, he, and, he, and he's concentrating on the other tribes. I'll give you the land of this tribe and that tribe, and you can have this land, right? So do you think these are... Um... Like, I don't know what your experience is. I know you've been to the jungle and you've done some shamanic journeying and stuff like that. And have you had these experiences of coming in contact with these kind of external intelligences or sort of uh, spirit beings or whatever you people want to call them, demons, angels, godlike voices? <laughs> Because hmm. this is this is I don't know. I mean, this is they... an, an interesting ex experience I've had um, on psychedelics, which yeah. is really. Um, well, this experience of communicating with something that presents itself as the other is what's kind of mm. kept me on the path of uh, of spirituality, kind of, because it's it's shown me that there is something more. And whether or not that something more is just, you know, lurking in the shadows of myself, I mean, who knows what it is, but it's it's an interesting experience to have. And I mean, <coughs> what is your experience with it, with this? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the kind of question. Is it inside? Is it outside? Uh, yeah, definitely. There's. Um, it feels like there's um, intelligences which are not mine, uh, influencing me um, when I'm working with ayahuasca, for example. Um, I guess the proof. What I find fascinating is when those things come along, and they give you a bit of information, which then turns out to be um, true. Like you know where you've where you've lost something, where your keys are, or. Um, like uh, for example, my wife um, dug up all this buried glass that she that had been buried like in the nineteen seventies. It had been sitting there for like this is about ten years ago, so it'd been sitting there for about forty years uh, in um, a particular part of uh, particular part of this community in the Amazon. Um, so when you get kind of confirmation from outside, I find that uh, I find that really really interesting. Um, whether they're inside or whether they're outside, uh, I mean, who knows. Uh, that's quite a big question. I mean, yeah, it kind of goes to whether this is inside or outside also, right? There was a... Well, I mean, it's inside, isn't it? Well, there, like, uh, there was, I'm hearing your voice. Yeah, yeah, of course. But through there was my uh, neuro. Uh, an Indian sage who said, inside and outside mean the same thing or nothing at all, because they imply each other. Yeah, yeah, So yeah, it's, kind, yeah, of, it's kind of one experience. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, think, I think of it like this, you know, um, like, for example, you're communicating to me now through, uh, through my ears and my neurobiology, yeah? The spirits communicate to me through my neurobiology, you know? So how am I to... Dis- I mean, it, it seems almost um, uh, discriminatory to distinguish uh, you as more valid than them because, I mean, both of you are communicating through my brain. All right. So maybe you can... Um... Some can can give me kind of the rundown of your experience uh, being in the Amazon and working with ayahuasca. <clears throat> um, so I mean, I, I started drinking daimi in Japan. Uh, okay. So and that was what um, eighteen, nineteen years ago now. Yeah, a long time ago. Um, so I drank there for five years when I was living there. Lived there for six years. Drank for five years there. And then I left and I came back to England and then I spent about a year and a half here and then I went to go live in the Amazon. And um, I went there specifically with two goals in mind. One was to finish writing my book and the second one was to learn about the power of ayahuasca, let's say. And I hadn't been there very long. I'd only been there a few months when I got, you know, and, uh, I was having quite a good time, you know, I was cutting, cutting uh, ayahuasca vine and making ayahuasca and drinking a whole load, living in the jungle, um, in this community. And I got bitten by a sand fly, which is a type of, well, it's a fly. And this fly, the bite turned into a pimple and the pimple was on my chest. The pimple kind of grew and grew and grew until it became this like massive ulcer, like pussy, nasty thing. And the people around me said, man, you've got leishmaniasis or leishmaniosa in Portuguese. It's kind of a lovely word in Portuguese. And it's a flesh-eating uh, colony, a cousin of leprosy, and they all kind of flipped out. They said, man, you've got to go and have injections. You need to take antimonium tartrate because um, this can... The second stage digests the cartilage in your nose and your ears and your throat and your whatever, wherever, wherever you have cartilage, right? So that's the second form of leishmaniasis. So um, I... You know, as I said, I'd gone out there for a specific reason, which was to learn about the power of ayahuasca and to write the book. And the book was a lot of it was about medicine, history of medicine, which is my my uh, my um, my degree at university was in history of medicine. And um, I was um, it gave me a very good opportunity to actually test out if ayahuasca was was what it was. When I say ayahuasca, I should be a bit more clear. I'm talking about daimi here. because Daimi is a particular lineage of ayahuasca. Uh, in a certain format and taken in a certain way with quite a lot of uh, discipline and let's say um, protocols as to how to take it um, so yeah my, my path has been with with Daimi so I decided um, actually what I did was I drank a dose I didn't know what to do everyone was saying listen you've got to go if you go if you go today to the hospital you can have maybe 80 injections if you leave it till tomorrow it's going to be 120 injections if you leave it till later it could be 230 injections and the injections of antimonium tartrate which is a which is a heavy metal man and i hadn't taken any pharmaceuticals since i was about 16 uh, at that point and i was already kind of in my let's say mid 20s mid to late 20s by that point um and i really didn't want to take it uh, but everyone was saying you're going to lose your nose uh, if you don't because they don't believe that you can treat that disease with that medicine. And like I say, that my degree was in this kind of stuff. So I studied how Ayurveda had been pushed out by interventionist pharmaceutical medicine. I studied this kind of stuff all over the world. And I've seen the same thing happening at the kind of border between the jungle and the city in, uh, in Rio Branco in Brazil, just by the Bolivian border. So, so I drank a dose. And I asked what I should, what I should do, and I got um, I had a series of visions, and the visions were of all the people who'd come up to me and said, "Look, look, I had this disease. Look at my look at my scars. I took um, these injections. You've got to take these injections." And all of them still had something wrong with them, like one of them had these weird bumps on his legs, and one of them had um, like the, all all his joints were painful because antimonium attacks your joints. Uh, one of them was like just pig ignorant and clearly hadn't learned anything. Um, and 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 all, uh, like this other side of the disease kind of revealed itself, and you know, um, in esoteric perspective on disease, like Manly P. Hall talks about this, um, it's uh, and and other people as well. But when you go out of balance, is where you get hit by a disease, right? In Chinese medicine, for example, uh, when you go to treat a disease, they they kind of put you, they put your meridians back into balance, right? So I didn't think this disease was. I mean, it was external, back to this question of external and internal. I thought that it had come, 
because there was something that I needed fortifying in myself. And I wasn't going to fortify it with heavy metals. I was going to fortify it with, fortify it with diming. And also it fit very beautifully into the trajectory of the story, which I was busy writing. And I'm a bit of a sucker for plot lines. So I decided I wasn't going to take um, these injections. I was just going to drink diming. So I drank loads and loads of diming um, under the tutelage of a curandero, Padrino Nonato, his name is. And uh, so at one point I was drinking every day for about four or five months, drinking at four o'clock in the morning. Um, yeah, it was crazy, man. I lost 10 kilos. Um, I've got a really good scar. Uh, I lost a, uh, I kind of had an ex-wife who had come back into my life and then I lost her. And then I lost these rose colored spectacles, which had been stuck on my face for far too long. You know, I lost a whole load of stuff that I didn't need. And, you know, I was about purging, getting rid of stuff that you don't need. So it did a, it did a real number on me. And I came out quite a different person, I think. And it cured you of uh, of the leprosy cousin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Uh, and a whole lot more. Yeah, and a whole lot more. Yeah, that's interesting. So, what is the what's the difference between like a traditional ayahuasca sort of uh, tradition versus the one that you were the daime that you were a part of? Yeah, so daimes. Um, Daimi arose in the 1920s around then, right? Um, so it has a whole, it has 100 years of tradition. Yeah. Um, before that, you have the, um, you have the various indigenous and mestizo uh, traditions. And most of them, in fact, I think pretty much all of them, shamanism involves someone going off on their own to the jungle for six months or 10 months or a year, uh, practicing sexual abstinence, um, usually like uh, having dietas, like uh, taking a plant over and over again, sometimes drinking ayahuasca. Um, but different tribes do it differently. But, you know, some of them will say that you don't change your clothes for the entire time. Um, you know, they, there's they, the, 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 the foods that you eat are very restricted. And so when we talk about, like, when people talk about the shaman, shamanic experience or a shamanic ceremony, it's very, it's nothing like actual shamanism was, um, let's say, a hundred years ago. Um, you know, people didn't get together to drink ayahuasca. The shaman would drink ayahuasca on your behalf and then come back with a diagnosis for you. You say, okay, you've got this thing because, you know, somebody, you betrayed somebody, whatever. You have to overcome it by eating this plant and doing whatever it might be, burying, a, I don't know, all, all kinds of things they could say, some kind of magic. Um, so what Mestri Ireneo, who is the founder of my lineage uh, of Daimi, did was he... he he was a border guard, actually, a very tall black man from the other side of Brazil, from Maranhão, from the coast on the, uh, what is it, Nordeste, the eastern, yeah, the eastern coast, uh, went over all the way to the other side of, of the country, and he was seeking his fortune when the rubber boom happened, right? Um, and he encountered, he was working as a border guard, border guard, he encountered some Indians, probably from the Hunikuin tribe, and they taught him how to use um, ayahuasca. And then he was working as a curandero. Um, he was treating uh, people, including treating some of his enemies in a traditional manner. So he was using Icaros uh, and he was shaking his maraca. But his own kind of lineage, let's say, developed into uh, a slightly different style, um, which was a communal ritual. Um, so everyone would drink and then everyone started playing. One day he said, everyone's going to play maraca, which is like the percussion instrument, like a maraca. He said in English, say maraca. Um, I'm just going to close the door because my family okay, just arrived yeah. and they're loud. No um, <clears throat> so he started, so he, um, so he was, he kind of took it out of the jungle into an urban and like a kind of Catholic context. So the, um, the influences into Daimi are folk Catholicism, some influence from the kind of um, spiritist tradition in Europe and uh, indigenous animism. Um, so what do you, what's the most kind of supernatural thing you've experienced? Because I've heard some of these shamans can have, uh, like I was reading, uh, I think in this in the same book, this book I was talking about, the Cosmic Serpent book, book, it was talking about shamans being able to shoot astral darts and stuff like that through their hands and this kind of thing. Have you seen any of this? Have you experienced any of this during your shamanic uh, ex exploration? Um, yeah, it's kind of difficult because in our in our in in Brazil um, in this tradition they say if you share your visions you will lose your visions, um, and so you know in um, in a kind of more either a therapeutic setting we kind of have this idea that you should share your dreams and you should share this and share that. 
which may make sense in a kind of therapeutic setting. And, you know, if you take acid and you go and see a band and you encounter, I don't know, whatever you might encounter, it might be appropriate to share it. But there's not a whole lot of what I've seen that I would really want to share. Um, right. And there's a number of reasons for that. Like, um, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's an occult thing. It happens within um, in like a kind of crucible. And I don't really want to invite to yeah like I, I i'm not in the habit of um of showing wisdom i will tell you one thing i i had um one session um where i got visited i think by a celebrity music uh a celebrity magician or a, quite a famous magician from the kind of uh early 20th century um and i said during the session i said look what are you doing here this isn't your lineage and Furthermore, I don't do celebrity. I don't do celebrity uh, mediumship, and I, I was send this guy away. And uh, immediately after the session, somebody came up to me and started talking to me about that particular magician. And this was the only time in like eighteen years that a Brazilian has come up to me and talked to me about that guy, which I thought was quite weird. And then you know we can you know, the the we ate some food and whatever all that stuff happened. And then later on, I got a lift home with another guy. And this other guy also brought up this same magician. So two people kind of uh, mentioning this guy's name after he'd popped up in a session. Um, that was quite weird. Yeah. Yeah. Would you consider someone like Aleister Crowley, would you consider him uh, to be a shaman? Um, three times. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting dude, isn't it? He... He certainly had access to the spirits. Uh, he practiced divination. Um, he did magic for healing. He did magic for a lot of these things. Um, he would have called himself a gentleman. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if he would have called himself a shaman. You know, this, the, the, it's, a, it's a complicated term, right? You know, uh, I've got a good friend, uh, Julian Vane, and his definition of shaman is the guy with the, the, guy with the hat who also has the drugs. Um, I, I mean, while I quite like the definition, I don't. It's certainly what. It's certainly not what in, what a, a shaman is in um, in Brazil. They don't actually use that word. They use they say page yeah. uh, in Brazil. Yeah, the in term Mexico, comes from in Mexico. They call them tapa poques. Right. Yeah. So um, just beca- the thing about uh, uh, it's like this: if you practice divination amongst your tripping then yeah i think you can probably call yourself a shaman if you've done if you've done the dietas if you've done the the practice or kind of st- kind of stuff like that um i keep meeting people who've you know spent 3 weeks in the jungle and they're dishing out psychedelics to people uh right. and they're calling themselves shamans and yeah. um it's certainly it, it, the, the meaning of the term has drifted a long way right you know terence mckenna was um in some way responsible for this you know he kind of talked about sham- he talked about sh- the shaman in a way that um no anthropologist in their right mind would <laughs> yeah so have you ever had any any of these kind of experiences um outside of taking psychedelics like maybe through some kind of uh, different method or uh you know like some of these uh, especially like european traditions talk about like uh looking into mirrors or this kind of stuff um, yeah, I've messed around in some circles here and there. Um, I've stared into the odd mirror. I was in a Buddhist tradition for a couple of years. Um, I've just uh, I've just got a, an article coming out on Three Hands, a book on Three Hands Press called Diamond and Pharmacon, and that's talking about Goetia, as in um, the magic of Solomon the King, um, working with uh, some of the some of the spirits of of of, of his like the lesser key of Solomon. Um, yeah, I've been interested in the occult since, um, well, since at least... Someone taught me a spell. When I was about 21, uh, this dude... I had blue hair, and this other guy at my university also had blue hair, and uh, so we got talking. And it turned, and he kind of taught me a spell, and I laughed in his face because um, I didn't think the world worked like that. And I tried it out, and it worked. And I tried it out again, and it worked again. And then I got really interested. I kind of, I got, I got, I started reading lots of Alistair Crowley, for example, and some other um, occultists, and um, ended up getting myself a, a tarot deck. And the kind of information that came out of that was uh, so. Basically, the answer to your question is, yeah, I've been uh, into this stuff well before I got into uh, 
ayahuasca, let's say. Yeah, same with me too. I've also, I mean, I remember reading uh, or trying to read Aleister Crowley books when I was a kid. They were a bit too dense for me, and I've, I'm actually a little keen to get back into them. But I remember that's the first time I've heard of sort of spirit invocation through plants. When it was when I was a kid, and it was uh, through Aleister Crowley reading something he's done. I think he was contacting some sort of gray-looking being, Lamb, maybe his name was, or something like this. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's Lamb. Um, he. Um, yeah, I mean, he's very complex. Um, a good starter, a good, a good book to read of his, or, or, or a book with his stuff in it, is called A Portable Darkness. And it's got an introduction by um, Genesis P. Orridge and Rob Anton Wilson. It looks at him as um, primarily a linguistic philosopher. And it has a kind of anthology of, of his writings and then like an introduction from this guy. It's a brilliant, it's a beautiful and brilliant book. Because his, his writing's really dense, man. Really, really, really complicated. Um... Yeah, but fascinating, dude. Like, completely fascinating. So have you successfully ever uh, ever invoked a sort of, maybe a, a psychedelic state through s one of those other methods? Um, I actually do this quite often in other people. Like, my, my, my day job is a hypnotherapist. And um, I gave a talk at Brompton Cemetery just down the road the other day uh, on Sunday. Um, and it was about hypnotism and the links between hypnotism and the occult in history. Um, looking at kind of Victorian uh, occultists and stuff, but while, whilst I was doing it, I was also kept on like putting the audience in and out of trance. Uh, and the final thing that I did was I, um, I kind of got them into a state where they would encounter a spirit animal, and then got the got them to turn into the spirit animal. So I got them to uh, to feel what it was like to have this animal overtake their. Um, overtake them, and in fact, um, Jeremy Narby. I can't remember if he if he if he tells this story in the in um, the Cosmic Trigger or if, or if he just told this uh, story in uh, one of the times I've seen him. But he tells a story about um, taking tobacco paste and then feeling how his teeth become. Um, I think it's a jaguar, but he starts to notice that his his teeth have become uh, spiky, and he's getting really kind of hungry and. Um, uh, thinking in a slightly different way, so uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can induce you can induce states actually quite easily. It just requires a bit of perseverance. Do you think that's kind of what magic is, or on like a on maybe a surface level, is kind of this hypnotic sort of trance state that maybe culture or um, intentionally corporations and stuff sort of invoke or cast upon us? Do you think that's kind of what we're experiencing in life? Um, I think the techniques of magic in, uh, often involve trance. Yeah, um, like if you look at a uh, Let's say a, 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 an occult ritual to um, to work with the energies of, um, of Venus, for example. It's going to have the number seven somewhere in it. It's going to have the colour green somewhere in it. So you might have, say, seven green candles. Like cabalistically, those are the numbers, numbers and colours of Venus. It's going to have some rose incense in it somewhere. It's going to have probably the the kind of invocation or uh, yeah, the invocatory language is going to be poetic to evoke that kind of feeling. And the direction of it is going to be some kind of a love spell. So all of the, let's say, all of the senses and also all of the stuff you've learned about magic is all focused down to a point. And that's what, that's how trance happens when you focus everything to one right. particular point. However, that's the, that's the technique of magic. The actual, um, let's say, the action of magic, which is to cause, and I, I think Crowley's definition is the best, to cause change in accordance with your consciousness, um, no, 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 that's just, uh, that's, 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 there's all kinds of mysteries that happen and yeah, like they happen in your head, but they also happen outside your head and that's the curious yeah. thing. Well, do you think, because when I, when, when I hear things like that, I always think of advertising and I think of the way that these companies will sort of invoke feelings of insecurity or something like that or invoke sort of some kind of, uh, you know, family emotional feeling and then attach that to a product which means absolutely nothing or something like that. Would you consider that kind of a basic form of, of, of uh, magic? Yeah, it's a kind of, it's a pretty low form, yeah. I'm more into kind of, you know, um, making your neighbour's cow produce sour milk and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm old school cool. about magic. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the same guy I mentioned, uh, Julian Bain, he um, he was recently asked to do a talk uh, at, at a, a, it was a keynote presentation, I think, at some kind of advertising uh, um, convention or something like that. So, yeah, they're right on to sigil magic. Those guys know what they're doing, you know. They've been doing it for, for a long, long time. Um, did you did you you ever watch the Joe Rogan podcast? 
Um, sometimes, yeah. Did you watch? Did you watch the one with uh, Alex Jones talking about uh, talking about these governments taking DMT and making interdimensional deals with these demonic <laughs> entities? Um, I think I remember Joe's face just kind of looking at him <laughs> in horror. Um, yeah, no, I can't listen to Alex Jones for more than about three minutes. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of, I kind of like the idea that something mystical like that's going on. Um, um, yeah, I mean, like, if we look at the British, the British, uh, the British Empire, uh, was came straight out of the the ideas of uh, of, of John D. You know, he predicted it and then um, kind of created it out of a tiny little island, a tiny little island nation that didn't really have very much. So uh, yeah, I mean, magic's powerful. I mean, if you go to the British Museum, you can see the obsidian disc. Uh, which he used to scry into, and there's oh, wow. also a, uh, a, a a talisman that he produced in order to um, scupper the Spanish Armada. You know, really cool. when the Spanish Armada came to England, it got wiped out by a by a storm on the way. I'm just now starting to learn about John Dee and this kind of magic stuff deeper. What do you think about um, John Marco Allegro and his kind of conclusion about what the Dead Sea Scrolls say? Um, I think as a scholar. Um, I think he kind of, you know, he, was, he clearly knew what he was talking about in terms of the languages. Um, I think he, uh, I think he opened the door to another way of thinking about scripture. Um, I don't think Jesus was a mushroom. Um, I think, uh, what's the guy's name? Thomas uh, Hatzis has pretty much demolished, I think, the argument about, um, as far as I'm concerned, about. Um, mushrooms in the bible because there i mean a there aren't any like if you if you want to find drugs in the bible there's stacks of drugs in the bible but there aren't any mushrooms there's no mushrooms in the letters between mystics at the time and they were talking about the drugs they were using this wasn't a taboo subject back in right. the day um so i mean where, where's the evidence the evidence is like what you what, what's this other book uh the psychedelic gospels which has come out recently Man, if you're finding like half a mushroom in a in a stained glass window in in a in medieval Europe. church in France. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it might be evidence of a mushroom cult that grew up at some point later, but no, I don't really, I don't really buy. Well, the, I, fi- the I find the timelines of uh, of these uh, churches to be interesting. You know, it's 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 late fifth or I think early 1500s is when you really start seeing these mushroom uh, art popping up in these in these churches around Europe, and that's around the time that the the Spanish was colonizing, um, you know, like Mexico, for example, where there's a lot of mushroom use, and th- and there is mushroom use in Europe too. So I'm not going to downplay the fact that it could be inspired from that, but I do find it interesting mm. that it's that the timeline is right around, you know, the colonization of. of these. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I think I think it makes a lot of sense that there were mushroom cults. You know, when we when people encounter interesting. Uh, cultures and interesting um, psychoactives. I mean, Daimi would be an example. The, the the syncretism between Catholicism and ayahuasca is very very vi- vibrant. You know, it, it reinvigorates um, uh, the tradition. So yeah, you definitely want to incorporate it. I just don't think it's there at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't really see too much evidence for it. So what do you think? Like something in like manna in the Book of Exodus. What's your uh, sort of explanation for that? Yeah, um, this might get a bit involved. So. I think it's ergot. So, yeah, that's as close as we get to mushrooms. It's a fungus. Right? Manna is described... Um, there's a couple of things about manna. Right? Um, one of the things is that um, there's one line in the entire Bible where you see synesthesia, right? where you see um, uh, a sound is, uh, is seen. You get this line, and all the people uh, were seeing the, uh, the, the sound of the trumpets. Um, and you don't normally see, you know, you don't normally see that kind of thing unless you're tripping. So, so it's just that's the only synesthesia in the Bible. It's also the only collective um, revelation in the Bible. They're all, all the, the kind of the Israelites are all around uh, Mount Sinai, and they all see this together. And they also see the 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 they also see the um, the mountain. It's burning with a a, a fire that uh, that doesn't consume. So it burns but doesn't consume. And if you Think about what the world looks like when you're on acid or something like that. It's quite often got these crazy, very colourful geometric patterns around the object of your attention. You know, so if you didn't have the language, you might call them flames that burned but didn't consume. Right? Um, another thing about that scene is it's all of the Israelites are eating manna together. Right? So from the, let's say, the phenomenology of the text, from the, from, from the, the, the experience that they're having, it looks like they're, it looks like they're tripping. If you look at manna itself... 
it resembles ergot in pretty much all of its um pretty much everything like for example the taste of it is described as uh, the taste of honey which is what ergot secretion does actually taste like um it's described as um like uh, like a kind of pellet size like pellets the size of coriander uh, and they're white and um i've actually got some frankincense here but it, it, it looks pretty similar you know um when ergot secretion uh comes off the plant it makes like uh like you can see one there um i'll find a white one this is a uh, frankincense but it makes little um little pellets that uh that sit on the on the plant or it drops onto the ground yeah and when it drops onto the ground it splashes because it's not viscous it splashes into a kind of um uh it makes a kind of frost and the other way that ergot is described sorry the other way that manna is described is like a frost that was uh, that was on the ground, right? And then there's this other thing about the fact of when it's found. It's found in spring in the Bible, which is when ergot comes out of its dormancy. Uh, it's only found where there is vegetation. It's not found when there's no water. They don't find any ergot. They don't find any manna. And I guess um, another thing which is quite interesting is that Moses says to the Israelites, don't leave any of this until tomorrow. And some of them do leave it until tomorrow, and they find that it stinks and it's got worms in it and it's, it's rotted. And rapid rotting it doesn't happen to any of the other secretions in the in the desert there are other secretions in the desert but um it's it is a function it is one of the factors of the ergot secretion it rapidly rots and it becomes toxic and there's a, just a couple of more things about why i think it's manna um it can be ground like the production of of manna uh the way you the way you use it in the bible is first it's ground and then it's boiled and then it's baked right and when albert Huff, hoffman Albert Hoffman used ergot to make LSD, right? Ergot contains LSA, which is a cousin of LSD and has quite similar effects. But it's toxic. If you take it on its own, um, ergot is toxic. But if you grind it up and then boil it, it separates into two fractions. It separates into a water-soluble fraction and a non-soluble fraction. You, the, the non-soluble fraction has the poison in it. If you get rid of that and you're left with the, the soluble fraction and then you bake it, i.e. You, you put it in the oven or whatever, and you end up with crystals which contain LSA, which are my, you know, mind-blowingly powerful crystals. And, you know, manna, we get this idea that manna is like kind of, you know, food aid dropping out of the sky. But in fact, it's not. It's, it's, um, there's, two, there's two foods that are given in the Bible. One is, one is uh, quails which kind of drop out of the sky. Um, and that's, the, that's the, the meat that they eat. You've got this line, uh, in, the, in, in, the, um, in the evenings you shall eat meat, and in the morning you are satisfied with manna. And manna is, the, is one of the two things that they eat in the Bible. It's a secretion, and in that line, which I just said, it's the manna which gives satisfaction. So the, the quails, as in the meat, isn't described as satisfying the Israelites. It's the manna uh, that is. Nice, yeah, that's cool. So I, I, most people seem to think, I mean, when you read books, I've read, what was that? I mean, I've just bought the, the Psychedelic Gospels, and uh, there was another book. But most people, I've seen, you're the only person I've really found break it down into being an ergot. And don't, didn't, didn't they think that ergot uh, was also what, what was responsible for the kind of witchy stuff that happened in, uh, in, the, in, the America, in America with Salem? Some kind of bad bread? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about what happened in, in, in Salem, but I wouldn't be surprised. You do get kind of outbreaks of uh, ergotism. And that comes, and that comes uh, in, in bread? In Europe. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, on, on rye, uh, on various cereals. You know, and they call, is found. And they call um, manna is referred to as bread sometimes, isn't it? Couldn't, could, it, could, it be a, yeah. like, could it be a sort of molded bread that these people are eating and it actually is bread? Um. That's quite interesting. I mean, bread is generally used as um, as a word for food in general. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you may be onto something there. I mean, I just want to just kind of correct you on one thing. There's a guy called Dan Merker who wrote a book called The Mystery of Manor. And he was, I think, the first to identify manor as ergot. Um, I hadn't read his book when I identified it as ergot. And some of the information that I've given you there isn't in his book. Um, but yeah, and no, I wouldn't want to take credit for all of that. Right. Um... What do you think about Jesus going to India? You ever heard that that theory that Jesus went to India? Yeah, I really like that theory. You know, I haven't looked too deeply into it, but I mean, you know, why not? Jesus went to Japan. There's um there's a place in Japan where they've got this story about it with how his brother uh, died on the cross, and there's a there's a grave there. Jesus came to Glastonbury, apparently. You know, when when I was in um, Brazil one time, walking in the jungle, and there was this really spiky vine. And I asked 
the guy I was with, I said, what's that vine go- called? And he says, oh, that's called the Spinos dos Judeus, which means the, the spikes of the Jews. And I said, whoa, why do you call it that? And he goes, well, that's the, that's the thing that was used on the, oh, Jesus to make the Jesus' crown. Now, if you look at the, the, the Middle Eastern traditions, it's not the case, you know, that's the Acacia, Acacia sale, which is used. But I quite like the fact that these people had seen a spiky, um, a spiky vine and kind of built it into their cosmology. I mean, obviously it's a very anti-Semitic cosmology, which is a little, a little bit challenging. Um, but, I, you know, I think we should all take, um, let's say, uh, take... Um, I, I think we can all have our own Jesuses, you know, we can all have our own personal Jesuses. Yeah, um, yeah, I think so too. Why not? I know that in Kashmir... Mine's much cooler than the guys in Alabama. <laughs> yeah, right. I know in Kashmir they actually have a tomb for Jesus and for Mary and for Moses, I believe, too. Dude, they're, they're, yeah, yeah, Moses. They've got them all over the place. Yeah. Uh, you're not much of a nation if you don't have a Jesus tomb somewhere. <laughs> right. Um, what do you think about uh, the Nephilim? Who are these Nephilim, these fallen angels in the Bible, or these beings that came from the heaven to earth? Uh... I don't know, man. Uh, yeah, interesting. Like, really, really interesting. But um, I've got no idea about no. that one. Well, what do you think? Um, well, I only know the conspiracy theory uh, sort of. Ver- I never actually read it, the quotes myself, so I kind of just am uh, hoping they're aliens. I mean, it'd be nice if they're aliens, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it that, would be really nice. Cool. It'd be really, it'd be the coolest uh, thing ever. Some giant it's aliens. It's a lonely planet. <laughs> well, what about aliens? Do you think aliens exist somewhere? And do they worship Jesus? <laughs> well, was Jesus an alien? Uh, I mean, like some of those entities that you were talking about before, you know, the things that appear in your head. Yeah. Uh, they feel quite alien, you know, some they of them. Do feel, like, they do uh, they yes. feel very alien or like some kind of maybe blend of dimensions where we are sort of... Uh, what I think it is, or what I've kind of had the mushroom explain to me, is that we're too distracted by our thoughts all the time. So we're too lost in this world of thoughts, which kind of creates this this uh, normal state of consciousness that we that we work our days through but when you take a psychedelic or when you do a meditation practice or something like this some kind of method that slows your thoughts down it sort of um, allows you to perceive more information because you're not so distracted by your thoughts and i think in the psychedelic space that this happens and you sort of some kind of uh, merging of dimensions happens and there's there's beings that exist there yeah, so I, I think you're right on that one. I mean, of all the uh, people who seem to think that they've got, you know, probes from alien space clubs up their bottom, no one's ever actually found a probe up anyone's bottom. Um, so I think the kind of what they call nuts and bolts alien theory is, um, a li- the evidence for it is a little bit weak. You know, um, you have to go quite down the conspiracy uh, rabbit hole into kind of futuristic technologies and stuff like that. And even futuristic technologies, they could come from other dimensions. If you look at like Tesla, for example, there's a dude who was um, was walking in the park in Budapest and had a vision of the AC motor and took 500 patents from his life, all of them, all of them through visions. You know, the guy never made a, never made a, a blueprint, never made a calculation. So I think, I think, you know, even the advanced technologies, I don't think I mean, you, you need to... Uh, you could even you have uh, flying sources. You could even look at technology itself as coming from some kind of uh, from some some other dimension. And that I always I always think about this as technology being some kind of interdimensional alien that's just harnessing our energy through uh, I don't know our our uh, rituals of capitalism or competition, and it's just sucking our life force out as a way to manifest itself into this physical dimension. So we could be evoking I mean, it... we could be evoking a demon that we just consider technology. Dude, what was it? There's a line from um, um, Eric Davis's book, uh, Technosis, where he talks about every technological advance amputates something. You know, so the car amputates our legs to a degree. Oh, and, yeah, you know, like I remember back in the day, I used to know people's phone numbers. You know, I don't know anyone's phone number anymore. I've got a phone that knows phone numbers yeah. on my behalf. That's kind know? of interesting because that um, would mean that we're slowly <clears throat> progressing towards becoming machines, which I, I mean, it seems, it seems like, I mean, if you... If you kind of look at the pattern of what's happening, it seems we're kind of we're progressing that way into merging with machine worlds. Well, I think even and it's not just us, you know. It's like the, the I mean, this is kind of terrifying. But if you look at the, say the, say the orangutan, right? Say the orangutan. Go back a hundred years. Go back two hundred years. Almost no one outside of Borneo and Sumatra would have ever seen an orangutan. 
very few people would have even heard of them, you know. And, you know, someone shot one and brought it back to the British Museum. People start to see a dead orangutan. Um, and then over, you know, the last 100, 150 years, we learn more about them. We've got video footage of them. We've got them in our zoos. We learn about their gut flora and their social dynamics. People write PhDs on them. And all the time that this information about orangutans is collecting, the actual orangutan population is just being snuffed out slowly yeah. by all kinds of pressures. And I, I find that fascinating. Like, pretty much everyone in the world now knows what an orangutan is, but there's not ma- many of them left. And I get the feeling that we are our world is turning into information like and that's the only thing that will be perhaps be the only thing that you know, on my pessimistic days is i don't think about this all the time but i just wonder if um if we're just collecting a little you know like when um when a plant is about to die it produces like a um a flush of beauty like it puts it puts out loads of flowers and then it directs all its energy into the seed you know we, we haven't even had this expression it's going to seed you know so it's putting all that information into a hard container which can then last through the winter uh and regrow um regrow somewhere else so i kind of you know when i'm daydreaming sometime i imagine that the machines will remember us in and not just us the entire um ecosystem in intricate detail and perhaps perhaps somewhere on another planet or perhaps on this planet after millions of years have passed and we're in a situation where we can support life again maybe the machines will kind of put life back together again. Uh, That's an interesting theory. I mean, I could see it. I, you could see it working out that way. You know, I, a part of me thinks that biological life can't travel through space, and that's why we don't find any aliens going anywhere. And that's kind of why to leave the planet, you almost have to create, to become technology to leave the planet. Because I don't know if it's sustainable to be to travel through space in a body. Haven't they, haven't they found? I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure about this, but I'm, I, I understood that some bacteria had gone up to space and then come back again and still been alive. Yeah, I've heard people say mushrooms can potentially, like spores, can potentially survive in space. I do. I mean, the guy who knows more about mushrooms than anyone else in the world is Paul Stamets. That's what he thinks. Does he think um, he thinks that? So I. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah what a genius! Know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to. Exactly. If that guy, if that's what he reckons, I'm not really in a position to argue with him. Yeah, he has the mushroom man for sure. I loved what he said about how mushrooms dictate sort of or sort of orchestrate the environment. I watched that Joe Rogan podcast with that he did probably five times. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a brilliant guy. Fascinating. Like mushrooms are completely fascinating. Paul Stamets is pretty fascinating as well, yeah. What do you think we could communicate with mushrooms or the the, the reason we do communicate with mushrooms in the way that we do is because we are kind of fungal bodies that we evolved from these 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 kind of uh, cre- I mean, because fungus <laughs> mushrooms were the first kind of land life that we find, right? As far as fossils go. Yeah, indeed. Like, um, if you look at like, uh, I, I, I think not just mushrooms. You know, like THC, for example, uh, all the all the all, all, all the various different things that are in in cannabis, uh, they're insect repellents, and they have they have functions that work. Um, they 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 have functions in their in their world, and they're of us. You know, DMT is another example. Uh, we produce DMT, I think, in our lungs. Uh, it seems very likely. I don't know if the science is out about yeah. this, but um, yeah, we share all sorts with our. Uh, Which our is an interesting case for for communities. breathing. For breathing methods. Yeah, there's there's this guy. Uh, what's his name? Um, Eddie Flexka, who's a Hungarian psychiatrist, and his he was the first guy to discover a medical value in um, in DMT. He said it's uh, anti-inflammatory. So when you get into say, some kind of situation like a, like a car crash, for example, or some kind of massive trauma, you're, according to his theory, your lungs will release a whole load of DMT and it'll make your blood less likely to clog, which means that you're less likely to have a brain clot, you know? Um, if it doesn't work, uh, you know, if it works, you stay alive. If it doesn't work, then you have some kind of uh, DMT to take you through to the next life. <sighs> yeah, I mean... It's it's interesting. The afterlife's an interesting thing because I feel like uh, I feel like that's probably what happens when you're dying. Is you probably experience something like that. You you probably experience some kind of psychedelic trip or some kind of uh, <coughs> I don't know. It's when I took mushrooms recently in Mexico with these Mazatec people. Um, I was staring at all these different pictures they had of the saints up and stuff like that. They do it kind of through a similar blend of old pagan and Catholic influence now. And um, 
the mushroom told me that this space is reserved for those who are dying. And I thought that was an interesting thing to be told from uh, from the mushroom. It's like it was almost what like space? you're not supposed to be here type of type of vibe. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it would be nice, wouldn't it? I, I, I like to think in some other daydreams that uh, we get to revisit bits of our lives and spend as much as we much time as we like in uh, in certain bits and don't have to deal with the unpleasant bits. Yeah, I mean, maybe I think we, the, could, uh, we could be doing that. Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut has this idea of the, he talks about the Trafalmadorians, who are a, uh, it's kind of American science fiction writer, Kurt Vonnegut, and they experience time, they're aliens, and they experience time in a different way. They, when they see a person, they see a kind of centipede that begins as a baby oh, and ends up as an old man. Interesting, yeah. And these, and so the Trafalmadorians can just move to bits of time which they find more pleasant and not have to deal with bits of time that they don't like. That's really interesting. I heard enlightenment once explained as being able to relive all moments from all perspectives at once. Ooh, uh, yeah, I, I think I might feel a bit guilty. <laughs> <laughs> all the enemies you've wronged. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I think that would be, it'd be fair, though, wouldn't it, somehow? Yeah, maybe. Do you say it'd be sad? Yeah, no, it'd be fair. Like, um, you know, there doesn't seem to be any justice on this planet... Um, but it would be nice if uh, uh, you did have to deal with what you'd done to other yeah. people. Well, that's another I mean, thing. Maybe it's just a re- the mushroom also showed me that. Of mine. <laughs> yeah, no, I, the mushroom. Oh, really? showed, yeah, well, the mushroom showed me once how all these little. It, well, it kind of showed me how karma works in the sense that every little small. Maybe I was being a dickhead one day or something like that, and I said something to someone, and it showed me how my sort of intention or the mood I was in echoed out into this person's life and sort of uh, grew into maybe an insecurity or it just showed me this ripple effect that all, all my actions had onto people and uh, <clears throat> yeah I don't know I got my mushroom t-shirt on today look yeah I know I see that that's cool it's just a ride THTC I used to work for these guys they um, they're uh, the hemp trading company they're a hemp company uh, working out of England so I'm ripping their t-shirt there's a lot of um, a big mushroom tradition over there in Europe from I mean historically what do you think about like the fairies and stuff you think that's uh, that comes from mushroom visions fairies uh, and all maybe. these uh, gnomes um, I don't know I mean I mean who knows if there's a mushroom tradition we've definitely got a fairy tradition well, uh, do, I think well, the isn't there are... isn't there sort of uh, isn't there mushroom traditions that are that are found in Europe um, it depends where you look. I mean, there's a book called Shroom. Um, what's the guy who wrote it? Uh, Andy Letcher wrote a book called Shroom, where he kind of crit- he kind of critiques this um, this perspective because there isn't again there isn't any evidence of uh, you know the first reports of people taking mushrooms are a kind of Victorians who've who think they're being poisoned. You know? Really? Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're described as intoxication. Um, so maybe uh, we certainly had hembane. We certainly had. Um, other things that were used for their psychoactive potentials, but whether there was like an indigenous mushroom tradition mm, doesn't seem to be too much evidence of it. Oh, okay. I'm not saying that, 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 that there isn't, because right. you know a lot of history is history is written down. You know, so for when the culture was illiterate for such a long time, unless it was church stuff, and even you know even the monks were illiterate in 10th century. Most of Europe, the monks couldn't even couldn't you know. Their Latin was almost unreadably bad, you know. So we, that's why they call it the Dark Ages. You know, we had this whole period where we don't know what happened because no one, yeah, could, right? no one could really write. So we, we, you know, we don't know. Cool. Well, that's we did about an hour. Is there anything else that you want to 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 release to these people of the world? Um, where no, to find your book? Just, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, my book. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. So that's my book. It's called Neuro Apocalypse. Um, that's my second book. Uh, so that you can get on Amazon, for example. Um, my first book's called Science Revealed, which is currently out of print, but when my publisher pulls his finger out and does the proofread, then the second edition of that is uh, coming out. And then what else? I'm talking at Breaking Convention in... Um, when's that? It's a couple of months in England. I'm talking at the Girona Ayahuasca Conference. That's quite soon. That's at the end of... I think it's at the end of this month. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that's going to be a really good one. If anyone's interested in ayahuasca, get yourselves to Girona. Um, it's the ICERS, I-C-E-E-R-S conference. And then, what else? You can check out, like, you check out Psychedelic Press, which is my publisher. They've got a bunch of articles by me, and there's a load of 
podcast on YouTube, and my Twitter handle is um, Rev Nemu. So that's R E V N E M U. And I do want to say one more thing, which I um, I think is quite important um, for psychedelic people. Um, and I often say this, but if you, in my tradition, right, um, the Daimi tradition, we are forbidden from proselytizing and we're forbidden from doing propaganda and saying how wonderful it is. So I, I, I like the fact that we are enthusiastic about psychedelics. I'm obviously enthusiastic about them. But I think if we have a kind of missionary bent to how we do things, then the best way for us to be advocates of psychedelics is by being as cool and as moral and as sound as possible rather than telling people they need to take drugs. Yeah, I agree with that. I think psychedelics is a, it's a real serious thing that it's, well not only one can it be you know uh mentally sort of uh difficult, but um yeah, it's a journey. It's something that demands respect and I think uh I think tradition doing it in a tradition is important at least to me, you know, that's why I've gone to Mexico and kind of done my seeking and stuff like that. So I agree with that message. I think that you should take psychedelics seriously. It's not something that you should just take at a in a trailer park somewhere with your friends I mean you can still giggle oh I must, must ask actually in, in um, this Maztec uh, ceremony yeah. were people giggling or on mushrooms as well well it was just me uh, <laughs> it was just me an old lady and my friend and uh, we were just in a different dimension for the most part but I've had I've, I mm. think giggling's alright giggling can be healing I don't think I, I don't think it's think... great I just wonder yeah, we... I just wonder if this Curadera's giggle um, no she wasn't giggling she was, she's a really old lady she doesn't even speak Spanish she speaks Mazatec so uh, it, we could hardly communicate with her. But I was surprised. We did it at night, and she's got to be pushing 90 years old. And she 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 held space for about seven hours, just chanting and keeping this copal lit and just you know busting out this ceremony. I was really impressed. Uh, I couldn't understand anything she said, but it was it was it was impressively deep. Yeah, you had the mushroom to talk to. Yeah, I had the mushroom to talk to. But yeah, thanks so it's much. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, I've been so keen to have you on here for a long time. I hope we can do it again. I'd like to have you as a reoccurring guest on my YouTube and podcast. Um, maybe we can figure Good, out. Hit me up. Yeah, we'll figure out a way to make this a little bit more uh, uh, better quality. Uh, but yeah, I, I love this conversation and I love the work you do and I love uh, the knowledge that you bring to people. Um, you don't find too many people that are interested in the kind of stuff that you're interested in. So uh I think you are a well of knowledge, and I'm happy to be associated with you. Thank you very much. You're making me blush. <laughs> cool. Make sure to go check him out, guys. Um, I talk about you a lot on my, on my uh, I think I messaged you on my podcast a couple times and on my live stream. So, yeah, check out him. Check out uh, Reverend Danny Nemu and his books on Amazon or his book. And uh, much love, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks a lot. Boom. Cool. I turn this girl off. That was fun.